This morning I want to talk to you about praise and worship. However, I don't want to talk to you simply from an aspect of music, or what we call what we call a praise and worship uh, time, what we see in the concerts. I want to talk to you beyond that. Praise and worship uh, is uh, part of it, is music. The Bible tells me in the book of Revelations that a song is being sung. And so uh, we see through the Old Testament that music is a part of it, but it is not limited to. It's not limited simply to music. And in fact, we, even when we talk about praise and worship, if you'll bear with me, I need to reverse those two. I do not believe we are going to be able to understand praise until first we have a clearer view of worship. And if I may humbly suggest to you what is called the Socrates, Socratic method, it goes like this. It is impossible for you to learn until the first thing that you learn is that you need to learn something. So if you would... If you will take all of your certainty for just a moment and set it underneath in your seat and just pay attention to the words that I'm going to bring to you at the end of the service, you can take the words that I share with you and the ones that you brought in and take them together. But would you please, would you please attend with an open mind for a moment as we speak about worship first and then we will discuss praise. I'd also like to suggest to you that I am not going to be able to give a concise teaching on either of these. I don't know that there is a possibility of having a systematic or concise and complete teaching on praise and worship. If it is possible, it is far beyond my abilities. I am just going to scratch the surface, but just in scratching the surface is enough to lay us away. And so please attend closely. First of all, if we are going to speak of worship and praise, it would benefit us to look at the most, at the highest authority of all, which is our Lord Jesus Christ, and look at the words that he says in John chapter 4. I'll ask you to turn there so that you can read along with me. I will be reading in the New American Standard Version, John chapter 4. However, in none of the translations is there a great big difference that I've seen in any of the major ones anyway. And so feel free to use whichever one you've got there. Remember that Jesus is talking to a Samaritan woman and he has demonstrated to her that he has some power and therefore some authority. He has demonstrated a power to her and therefore some authority. Now we know that Jesus has all authority. We just sang the song, all authority. And so with hindsight, we are able to look and say, whatever Jesus says here, that's how it is. No matter what anyone else might say or might think, he is the authority on the issue. So in John chapter 4, starting in verse 19, it says, The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and you people say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. What did he say? A time is coming where the place doesn't matter. Now, verse 22, he says to the Samaritan woman, you, plural you, meaning you outside of Judaism, verse 22, you worship what you do not know. We, meaning the Jews, we worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. However, but, he says, an hour is coming and now is. The statement he just said, he said, you guys worship what you don't know. We worship what you, we do know, but all of that is over. Now, at this moment, there is a new word on worship. But an hour is coming and now is. When the true worshiper 
will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people the Father seeks to be his worshiper. He has just set aside Jew and Gentile. But there are a people that the Father seeks to give him worship. He has just set aside the DNA and the nationalities. But he says, he says there is a person or a people that the Father seeks and they are able to bring him worship. The type of worship that is appropriate and fitting. And he says that those people will worship him in spirit and truth. Now you'll have to bear with me because I have a lot written down here because it is vitally important that I not skip any of the steps in this. So as you see me look down, normally I travel around and I just open my mouth. Today I need to stay concise with this. So bear with me as you see me looking down. A lot has been said about spirit and truth. What generally is spoken, generally what is spoken is, it means that it is from the heart, that it is legitimate, that it is not uh, pharisaical, it is not hypocritical, it is sincere. That is what is generally said. And the reason why they say that is they go, there's this thing called the letter of the law and the spirit of the law. So therefore, Jesus says, you have heard it said, do not commit adultery. That's the letter of the law. To physically go into a relationship with a woman other than your wife. And then he says this, but I say to you to look at a woman with lust, and you've already committed it. That's the spirit of the law. And so what they say is, in worship, it's not just enough to just sing the words, but it has to be sincere and legitimate. And, and this is true. It's just not the totality of what he is speaking. What he speaks when he talks about in spirit and truth is so far beyond just sincerity. So far beyond. And for instance, let me share with you the greatest worship service that has ever been recorded in history that took place on this planet. The greatest worship service of all time ever in the history of mankind, over three million people gathered in one place, singing and worshiping to their God. In fact, those who approached the arena where it was happening, the outdoors arena where it was happening, said, I hear the sound of warfare. There is a battle taking place. And Moses said, it's not the sound of of battle, nor is it the sound of victory. It is the sound of defeat. And as Joshua turned the corner, three million of God's people, three million plus, were worshiping with sincerity and exuberance a golden calf that they had made out of their earrings. And they said, this is the God who delivered us from Egypt. They were sincere and they were exuberant and they were loud, but God said, Moses, step out of the way because my wrath is about to come down on them. See, just sincerity is not enough. It is spirit and truth. What does he mean when he says spirit? Well, let us consider. Look at verse 24 of this same chapter. John chapter 4, verse 24 Jesus goes on to teach, to instruct. He says, God, God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. He begins by saying, as I'm talking to you about worshiping in spirit, let us first of all consider the object of our worship, the person. God is spirit. Jesus has some other things to say about God being spirit and about us in relationship to him. Would you turn, please, to John chapter 3? Right before he has this conversation with the Samaritan woman, he has a conversation with the Jewish leader. John chapter 3. As he explains to Nicodemus that a person must be born again, 
to enter the kingdom of God. He says in verse 5, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Let us consider for a moment, whenever I ask somebody, what does that mean, born of water and Spirit? What is the water part? They all say baptism. It means baptism. However, that's not what it is. In fact, he tells you right here in the same passage, he says, unless a person is born of water and spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. He has just put the two dynamics out there. Unless you are born of flesh and spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, you were born of flesh. Why does it say born of water? Ladies, what happens when you go into labor? What happens? Water breaks. He's talking about being born of flesh. Everyone in this room was born of flesh. If you had not been born of flesh, you would not exist. Therefore, you could not enter the kingdom. But being born of flesh is not sufficient. One must also be born again of the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh. Spirit gives birth to spirit. You have been born again if you have put your faith in Jesus Christ. If at some point you recognize that you were a sinner and that you were bound for for perdition, that you recognized that you were in need of a Savior, and you heard that Jesus Christ was in the business of forgiving sins and reconciling lost sons to the Heavenly Father, then you were born again. And at that moment that you were born again, the Spirit came alive inside of you. The Bible tells me that when God created man in His image, after He had formed him out of the clay, everything else He spoke into existence, but with man, he, he stoops and he takes handfuls and he molds and then he breathes into the nostril of man and he became a living being and then man, man sinned. And on the day that he would sin, he died. On that day, he died. His spirit died. But when we are born again, our spirit is revived. Our spirit, the spirit that is the you, is revived. And you are a new creation. You are no longer the dead in your trespasses and sins, but you are anew in the life of Jesus Christ and His Spirit takes up residence with your spirit inside of you right now, Daniel. Inside of you, there is a you. See, it's not the tent. This is just the camping tent that I go in. It leaks when it rains. Uh, the older you get, have you noticed older people? Do you notice the blood just is there? It's got, it's leaking. Right? It, it's getting a little frayed on top. That's not me. Hallelujah. He will give a new body to the me that resides in here. Nor are my thoughts me. There is an organ here, a brain. It's an organ like your liver, like your kidney. It's an organ. It has thoughts. It has the ability to think. But that's not me. In fact, it thinks a lot of things contrary to what me thinks. Me is here, inside. When I ask you, where do you live? You don't point to your head. You don't point to your arm. You don't point to your leg. Somewhere in here is me. One must worship God with the me. The person there is a person God is seeking. Randy is here inside. But not, that's not enough. It's not just the Randy. It's not just my spirit. Look at Philippians chapter 3. Verses 2 and 3. I hope you had nowhere to go. We're going to be here a bit. Philippians chapter 3, verses 2 and 3. The Apostle Paul writing to the Philippian church, which, by the way, this is called the happy letter of Paul. This is contrary to Corinthians, the letters to Corinth, or the letters to the Galatians, where he had to speak harshly to the Philippians. These are the ones who sent offerings. This is the poor church that sent offerings out of their need, like the woman who gave her last. The church of Philippi does that. He's speaking to them, and he says to that church in verse 2, Beware of the dogs. Beware of the evil workers. Beware of the false circumcision. For we are of the true circumcision who worship in the Spirit of God and glory. 
in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. In the New International Version, it says we worship by the Spirit of God. In a New, New American Standard, it says we worship in the Spirit of God. Either way, you've got, got going here a worshiper that God seeks. It's their spirit, but they cannot worship without the Holy Spirit of God interacting with them. I asked Tom when we started the service, Tom, will you pray that God will enable us, will touch us, allow us, equip us to worship? The worshiper that God speaks, it's the person inside and the Holy Spirit of God in conjunction doing an activity. As you see, exuberance is not what he's seeking. Some people think that if I say the same phrase over and over and over, I happen to enjoy uh, some of the songs from Jesus' culture, but there is one, let fire come down, that lasts for 17 minutes, and they are singing the exact same phrase over and over. That's not worshiping God in spirit and truth. That is manipulating and using certain aspects to create an emotional response. That's not the worship that God is looking for. You see, I, I don't need to move you into worship. You need to have already been moved when you approach here. I don't need to do certain things. I don't need to make enough noise that finally your adrenaline starts popping. I don't need to say certain words that stir emotions. The worship service here at Vista Hills is not to move you. The worship service here at Vista Hills is to give him his due. You come ready. Exuberance is not enough. Volume is not enough. Spirit and truth. Well, what does that mean? We've talked about spirit. Let us talk about the truth aspect. The Bible says the beginning of all wisdom is the fear of the Lord. If we want to talk about truth, the very first aspect of God that we must discuss is his holiness. Now listen. Listen. Jesus is called a rabbi. That means that he is a teacher. He is a, a teacher of the Jewish bent. Now, in English, when we want to make a point and we want to, in our writing, when we want to make a, a you know, like God is great, we put exclamation point. And have you noticed in your little text there will be three or four exclamation points? That's how we're trying to emphasize but a Jewish teacher did not emphasize in that fashion. A Jewish teacher emphasized by repeating. That's how you did it. You repeat it. So Jesus says, verily, verily, or truly, truly. The word actually is, amen, amen, I say to you. When he says to Martha, 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 or Peter, Peter, Peter. When he's repeating, that is the accent. That is the emphasis. When he says it twice. And many times in scriptures, you will hear Jesus say, I'm telling you this. And then he goes, I say it again. And you'll see Paul uses this as a Jewish teacher over and over. That is exclamation point. Pay attention. But there is only one attribute of God that goes beyond the dual and goes to the three. It is holy, holy, holy. We must first... If we are going to speak about worshiping God in truth, we must approach, first of all, His holiness. But how do we do that? This is not a word that we use in our American vocabulary other than in churchy settings. What does that mean? What does it mean that He is holy? Well, let us begin with this. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, did He not? And six days he created. The Bible says that out of nothing he created. He didn't borrow any material from anyone else. Out of the darkness he created the light. He simply spoke. In the beginning was God and God alone. 
And he determined, and no one told him, no one instructed him, he determined all by himself what he would do. He had decided, I love the word, determined. And he spoke, and what was nothing became matter and energy and time. And as he spoke each element into existence, light and water and the seas and the living vegetation and the swarming fish of a multitude of variety and birds filled the air of all colors as he chose. No one. He didn't say, what color would you like, Gabriel? He just chose. And it was good. And he created the heavens, and he created the earth, and he created man, and he created a garden, and he placed man in the garden. And on the seventh day, he sat down, he rested. Where did he sit? On his throne as the creator. All authority comes from him. He is the sovereign of all that is, including you, especially you. The Bible says the heavens are his throne and the earth is his footstool. Consider it like this. All that is, every single atom, every molecule, everything that is, he created by him, and the scripture says, for him. Why did he create? Well, first it was created by him, but then it was created For him. Would you look with me in scriptures to Colossians chapter 1 verse 16. Colossians 1 16 says this. For by him, meaning Jesus Christ. For by Jesus Christ, by him, all things were created. Both in the heavens and on the earth. Visible and invisible. The powers of the thrones, the authorities, all powers and thrones and authorities. It says visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, visible and invisible, all things have been created through him and for him. I remember asking the question, when God created the Garden of Eden, who did he create it for? And they go, man, I said, no. God created the Garden of Eden for him. He created man and placed him there to work it. This is so contrary. What I'm getting ready to reveal to you is so contrary to your American experience. But what I'm revealing to you is something that existed millennium before America ever was founded. It precedes the United States. It precedes our culture. It precedes all that we think about of what is good and holy. Long before America was founded, long before we came up with these certain constructs. You see, we threw off the sovereign. You remember old King George? We threw off the sovereign. Listen to me as Americans. We will have no king. No taxation without representation. We'll throw the tea in the harbor. We stand in rebellion to the king. Ooh, that is at the very source of lostness. And it's in our hearts. It's it's in our DNA. It's in our history. And we exalt it. And we worship that independence. But long before America was made, God sat on the throne He created. And the throne He created was all of the heavens. And where He put His foot was all of the earth. And that's where you live. That's why the Bible says, David goes, who is man that you're mindful of him? I am a speck on your footstool. And yet you have exalted him above all. You exalted. Where does authority come from? Where does sovereignty come from? The source of it is the throne of God. And he who sits on the throne. 1 Corinthians 15 says this, listen. 1 Corinthians 15, 20 through 28 says this, But now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who uh, are asleep. For since by a man came death, by a man also came resurrection 
of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also all in Christ will be made alive. But each in his own order. Christ the firstfruits after those, those who are in Christ at his coming. Now listen, if you want to know where it's all going, I just told you where it all started. Everything that was made was simply the chair he sits in. Would you consider that? Everything that has ever been made was simply a chair for him to rest in and to enjoy. Where's it all going? Then it says comes the end when he, he Christ, hands over the kingdom to God and Father. And when he has abolished all rule and all authority and all power, for he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet, under the Father's feet. The last enemy that will be abolished is death. And then Paul quotes, he says, for he has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when he says all things put in subjection, it is evident that he is expected to put all things in subjection to him. When all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself will also be subjected to the one who subjects all things. What does this mean? It means this. Do you think that Jesus is a pretty big guy? In what we just read, through him and for Jesus, all things were created. Would you say he's a pretty big guy? What have you created, Don, out of nothing? Have you ever created anything out of nothing? No. We create things, but we borrow stuff from God. Right? Jesus created everything. As big as the universe is, he created it all. I would say he's a pretty big guy. And he turns and places all of that. After he has accomplished his will, he places all of it at the foot of the Father and bows and submits to the Father. Then who are you, O oh man, to stand opposed to that one? Who are you to say, I will live my life how I choose to live my life? How dare you? What is worship? What does it really mean? It's one word. It's just one Hebrew word. I've written it down here in my notes. Let me see if I can find it here. Shaka. That's it. Do you know what that means? Worship. There's God. There he is in all of his majesty. Isaiah says, I saw the Lord in the year that Uzziah died. I saw the Lord high and lifted up and his train filled the temple. I don't think that was the earthly temple. I think that was the heavenly temple. The train of his glory, the robe that he wore, filled the heavens. What does that mean, the word worship? As I come into that presence, it is this. Amen. It is to bow, but not just to bow as an oriental bows. It is to be face down. But why? Because of the presence All authority comes from him. He wears the crown of the universe. Now here's what he's done. He has said to you, here, rule your life. And he hands you a crown. And that's yours. He says, you do whatever you want to. He said to Eve, when he put that tree that no one should eat from, that was him handing her the crown. Here, do what you want to with this. Worship is taking that crown that represents all that I have, every heartbeat, every thought, every moment, every dime, and I take it off and I say, no, Lord. Oh, no, Lord, it is yours. And then he lifts us up and he says, give him more to rule. Give him more crowns. Give him a family, Father. Give him a family to rule. And you have to take that. I am authority over my family. I must lift that and lay it. See, that authority came from who? Because you have genetics? It came from God. He gave it to you. But it is always and forever His. I want to talk to you about a couple of worship services that took place that didn't go well. We already spoke of the largest one. Let me speak to you about another one. A couple of sons of Aaron. 
decided that they would worship different from what God had prescribed. The beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. Do you know what we are missing here at Vista Hills and what we are missing in the United States of America? We are missing the fear of God. They took some incense that they thought would smell a little bit better than the one that God had prescribed, and they burn it, and he dropped them right there in the temple and told Aaron, don't you dare mourn for those boys. And told Aaron's nephews, those boys' cousins, drag those carcasses out and put them outside of the camp. What about Ananias and Sapphira? See, people were worshiping God. They owned property. They had crowns. They had their crowns. And they were coming into a worship service and laying the crowns of their property. It was theirs. But they knew where it came from. And in an act of abject, laying prostrate before the holiness of God, they laid the crowns down and said, God, use that for your glory. Use it however you want to. And two knuckleheads came in and pretended they lied to the Holy Spirit. You want to know what worship in spirit and truth is? Spirit is, is you and the Holy Spirit doing something in response to His magnitude. They walked into His presence and lied and He killed them. Can I tell you what I wish? I'm not the only one. I remember Jesus saying, I didn't come to bring peace. I came to light a fire and I wish it was lit. I wish we had worship services where people died. I wish the fear of God would rule again. Why? Because it tells me in Acts chapter 5, after that event, everyone was terrified of them, but they were held in respect. And God added to their numbers, and the apostles were performing powerful deeds. I wonder if our fake, insincere singing of psalms is not throttling the power of God in our presence. Do you think that the United States of America needs a church that's a little bit easier to get along or one where people die in it? I want to die. I want to die so I can live. I want Randy to die. I want the Spirit of God to own I want to be face down in his presence. Can you see him? The book of Daniel said that the courts of heaven were gathered and a throne was set up and the ancient of days came and sat upon that throne. And it proclaims his glory. Say, the holiness of God is that he's not like us. He is that one in all authority seated on the throne. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, but it is not the totality of wisdom. It's just the beginning. Worship must be done in spirit and truth. The Holy Spirit and my spirit in conjunction presenting to that awesome God what is his due. But then we have praise. What is praise? Whereas worship is us responding to who he is, praise is us responding to what he has done. The word praise means simply to lift up. It's simply to, whereas worship is simply to lay down, praise is to lift up, but not lifting up myself. It is lifting up him. Now, would you notice? He's already the highest of highs. So I cannot lift him up, but I can lift him up in your perception of him. He's already high, but why have I been preaching this morning? Because we can't see his altitude. So we open the scriptures, and from the scriptures we see his altitude. And our testimonies, one to another, proclaim his exalted place and the way that he does things. David says over and over and over, I love your ways. Teach me your ways. Let me see how you do things. Praise is seeing how he does things. So 
let us talk about the root of praise. I've spoke to you about the root of worship is his holiness. And there are so many other attributes of God. Let us speak of the praise of God for a moment, which comes first and foremost when we say of the things that he has done beyond creation, beyond revelation, although we could not have this without it. Would you consider this act of him? The Bible says in the book of Romans that the wrath of God is being revealed. You see, we do not fear him because we don't recognize the wrath of God. I would like to point out to you that Ananias and Sapphira happened in which half of the Bible? And which part of the Bible do you live in? If you're thinking that wrathful God is Old Testament stuff, you need to think again. I mean, let me just let's just consider. This is what it means when we walk into a service and we sing all to Jesus I surrender, but all week we have lived for ourselves. Here's what, here's what that is. How was Jesus betrayed by Judas? With a kiss. Judas walks in and he says, Rabbi, teacher, my teacher. And he kisses him on the cheek. That is the exact same thing that we do. When we, we're proclaiming you are my Lord, but actually I'm just trying to get you to help me accomplish my joys and my pleasure. Let me give you a kiss on the cheek. At least Judas at least Judas had the consideration to go bust his bowels out afterwards. But we do it week after week after week. We come into his presence and offer to him something that is not true. The wrath of God is being revealed against mankind because although they know all of the things that I just told you about his elevation, about him sitting on the throne, they know all of that. They absolutely refuse to give him the worship, but they will give it. They will submit and they will bow to created things over and over. I will submit to the IRS. I will submit to the police officer. I will submit to my wife. I will submit to my belly. I will submit to my, when I watch pornography, I submit to my hormones. I will submit to this. I will submit to this, but I'm free. I'll never submit to you. And then we come in and we worship him. The kiss on the cheek. The wrath of God is being revealed against mankind. Do you know the way the Bible describes it? The way Paul, he talks about it being stored up. I am told that the Grand Canyon was carved by the Colorado River. Now, what they tell you when you go there, if you listen to them, they will say, do you see the size of the Colorado River? And you go, yes. And they will go, the Colorado River being that size to carve this side of, the, of a hole would take six and a half million years. And then some idiot like me goes, but what if the Colorado River was six and a half million times that size at the end of the flood? Would it take one year? The wrath of God is six million times the size of the Colorado River. And it was held back by a dam that God had built called Mercy. Every sin, every tiny, every tiny moment of life without acknowledging his lordship, that's the worst sin. And we did it day after day. For millennial, we have done it. And the wrath of God was like a dam. And it piled up and it piled up and it piled up. And all of the wrath of God for all of the sins of the world, is there, and it's only held by his dam of his will. If he stops for a second, it comes like a deluge and destroys all of us, but not just with death, but eternal damnation and fire, which every one of us deserves for what we have done to his holiness. He held it back, and he held it back, and he held it back. And at just the right time, when it had reached its magnitude, its apex, he sits a cross up and hangs his son on it and removes the dam and lets all of that flow and hit him. 
And you and I stand in the shadow of the cross with the Son of God hanging on him as all of that wrath goes around us and does not touch a hair on our heads. Praise comes from what he has done. The Bible says in the book of Revelation that all of heavens start singing to the Lamb of God, Worthy are you, worthy are you, for you have bought lost mankind and given them to the Father. What am I trying to say here? Listen to me. Listen to me now. Every one of us needs to die right here in this place today. Every one of us needs to stop living for ourselves and start living for Him. Worship is a submission. Worship is is surrender. Worship is face down and saying, this life, this crown, these moments, whatever years you have given me, whatever gifts, whatever talents, whatever blood, all is yours. Spill it, shed it, spend it as you will. And praise is saying, because you took my sins. You lived for me. You died for me. You rose again that I might live. It's all yours. My house, my car, everything. In fact, let me just share this in closing. Let me explain to you why the worship service, we call it a worship service. Here's why it goes the way it does. I want you to hear this now. The worship service is to remind us and to enable us in some way to enact that together one hour a week. It goes like this. We come together for our Father's joy. He doesn't like looking at an empty table. He has set the table. His kids come. We come for his joy and his pleasure to his table. And as we come, we sing to him. And some of those songs that we sing, the words are expressing what our life is. Bowed and submitted to him. We bow down. We lay our crown. See, it's singing what has happened. At the feet of Jesus. It is expressing what you have already done. And some of the songs we sing are pray. What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. We sing of his wonders. We speak to each other in testimony. We pray. We bring ourselves to him and we confess with our lips in prayer. Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. You above all enable us to give you what is your due. And I preach. Why do I preach? Why do I preach? It is revelation. Behold, as Pilate said, behold the man. When I'm preaching, I'm going, behold your sovereign. Behold your God. Behold Jesus. I take the scriptures, I open them, and I draw pictures of who he is so that you might see him. Because to see him, now you're able to worship in spirit and in truth. You're not worshiping a golden calf, which I could do. I could tell you that this is your God. Your God is a lottery ticket. But I don't. I open the Bible and I show you from the Word of God. See, the preaching is important. What about our offerings? What is that? Take my crown. Everything that I have. See, we bring it and we, we, we place it here. All of my money. It's all represented right there. All of my life, all of my time, all of my purpose. It's represented. It's a picture. All that is precious of value goes here. And when it's done, we pick that up. We give it to God. We pray over it and ask him to use it. And then we have a benediction. Why? Listen. Why? 
so that you walk out now and everything that you just enacted here, this dramatization, everything that you just did here, you take out there and you live for him for the next six days. And I'll see you next Sunday. And we'll do it again. Amen? In just a moment, we will take up the offering. But before we do, somebody share with me what the Lord has spoke to you today. Who would share with the congregation what the Lord has spoke to you today? That we better get right with God and give him his due. And the beginning of that is fear him again. Someone else. Just take the mic from Ray. Someone else. Talk to us. What has the Lord said? The Lord is an awesome God. And I know for a fact that I need to have more of a willing heart as far as teaching young children in these academies, writing newsletters for our ministry. We've done it for so many years, and it's so easy as an older person to let the young people do it now and to sit down on our laurels. And so I know I struggle doing it. As much as I love to do it, I struggle. And so thank you for that reminder. Thank you. Someone else. Romans 12, 1. I know one of your favorite verses, uh, Pastor. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Maybe one more. Someone else. Um, I was reminded that we, we come together to do worship for the Father's joy, not for each other or not for ourselves or not to show someone else, but for his joy. Amen. Tom, I'm going to ask you, would you just ask him to help us one more time to give him worship that's worthy of him?